Good, good afternoon. Um, it's great to be here. It's great to contribute my small piece to the set of conversations of the last two days. It'll be really, really exciting. Um, I um, want to talk to you a little bit about the sort of uh, nature of field work that I've been engaged in over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, to me, the idea of field work really starts with trying to teach uh, my students about um, what to do when they're in the field, you know, how they engage with uh, landscapes and develop methods of working, of engaging the landscape that are both um, relying on ways to represent the landscape, but also indicative of, uh, you know, design uh, potential and opportunities as well. Um, so these are some of those drawings. To me, um, one of the most probably significant projects, uh, well, sorry, I'm going to back up here a little bit, I'm sorry, I'm going a little quickly. Um, this kind of thinking about uh, field methods is an idea that I've been thinking about for a very, very long time, and um, for me, the kind of sources that I try to rely on when talking about this work to my students um, really expands outside of architecture and landscape and tries to kind of bring in a series of projects, ways of thinking that are much, much broader. Um, I think the, I would say, the most important project as a young architect that I came across that I would say has transformed my whole world, really, how I think about architecture, uh, is a project called The Fake Estates. Uh, um, here is an artist who uh, uh, trained, as a, trained as an architect at uh, Cornell, uh, Matt Clark, who purchased at auction in the borough of Queens in 1974 a series of 13 or 12 or 13 uh, residual land parcels. You can see one in at the top right in red that have been put up for auction for $25 a piece. Uh, these are lots that are clearly, you can see that lot here. Um, what really fascinated me about this project as a young architect is the idea they would um, turn the idea of the site on its head. You know, this is clearly not a buildable site in the way that I know I had been conditioned to, to think about what sites are actually for in the world. Um, and uh, I think uh, one of the things that I sort of came to be so important about this project and such a kind of operative lesson for me and my work over the last 20 years is really to think about uh, projects that are not about speculating on a site but simply to reveal the existence of these places uh, to begin with. And I think to me that was a kind of power of, of thinking of the kind of labor or the kind of work that I might be doing in the future. Um, Matt Clark uh, initiated the fake estates in 1974. He died a few short years after. Uh, this is a short film uh, that um, uh, documents uh, him on the site uh, in the process of uh, verifying uh, the existence of uh, some of these properties. You can see here, you know, pointing at the lot that he had found or he had purchased. Um, and of course, being uh, completely obsessed with this project, uh, I uh, decided about 15 years ago to pay some of these sites a visit myself. I traveled to Queens uh, with some of the original maps of the fake estates uh, and tried to essentially find them in the landscape. And so you can see some of these sites clearly outline on the map uh, what I found when I arrived at these sites is really the kind of the identity of these properties was maybe not as uh, legible as it might be on a, on a map, on a Sanborn map. Um, I even came to wonder whether the fake estates as sort of legal entities as, as properties still existed. And so I decided that I would um, used the New York City property uh, da database to pay a visit to these sites. There are about a, a one million land parcels in the city. Um, all of them are um, accessible uh, on the database. 
one uh, sim simply needs to type in the sort of physical coordinates of that particular site. Uh, first, by typing in the uh, borough number, Queens is uh, number four, the block number and the lot, and up appears the sort of information uh, on the site itself. So to me, this became a kind of a representation or a verification of the existence of that place in, in a similar way that I had been able to travel to these sites in person and uh, visit them. So in a way, what the kind of argument here, these are two forms of verification of the same place. Um, while in the database, I discovered also that there was a, a really uh, nifty feature that enabled um, somebody to uh, essentially travel across by clicking uh, left and right, and that would pr provide you access to, to adjacent sites uh, in the database. And so essentially, if you wanted to uh, look at the site uh, to the west, you might click one click uh, left or one click right, and this would take you directly to the other property adjacent. Um, what I decided to do uh, when I discovered this website um, is that I might want to use it as a way to discover whether there would be other similar properties available uh, in the borough of Queens. I want to use it as a sort of instrument for exploration of the city. So what I decided I would do is I would start at the smallest block number, block one, lot one, uh, which is here, and I would essentially uh, travel across the entire borough of Queens. There are um, 360,000 properties across the borough of Queens, and very slowly over a process of six months, I was able to click my way across the entire borough. Uh, I don't mind, this is actually gives you an example of what it feels like to be in the database on a daily basis. Um, it is without question the most mind-numbing experience of my entire life. Uh, there were many moments where I thought maybe I wanted to stop doing this. Um, and, um, but I think uh, it also um, brought some moments of sheer joy. Uh, I'm arriving at one of these moments in a second. Uh, such as this site here, which is um, one eighth of an inch by 110 feet long, this sort of completely absurd property that uh, I think when I arrived at this site, I knew the whole project had been worth it. It really kind of showed me something truly extraordinary um, that I could only have found here. Um, this is a, is a drawing called uh, Lots Under $2,000 in the borough of Queens. It gives you an idea. There's actually quite a number of these properties uh, compared to the original fake estates. So my title for these new sites, uh, in a way, were fake, fake estates. They were similar. It was a, a play on, on, on words here. Um, and I was able to make some physical sort of full-scale cutouts of some of these properties uh, so that you can really see that uh, even uh, by the standards of the original fake estates, the size of these properties would almost make these look, you know, palatial in nature, the original sites. Um, became really intrigued with the idea um, whether these, how... Um, that these properties were in fact so small that they literally would not be uh, vi visible in a, in, a, in a typical map at Atlas. They would be thinner than a single line between two lots. And so I became interested in thinking about how to represent these sort of fake, fake estates in a way that would give, that would, that would make them, um, that would express their presence and trying to think about a way to kind of map that experience. Um, when you're in the database, uh, one page at a time, you really are seeing only one lot at a time, which is why that lot is uh, visible, because it's, it's shown in isolation. Uh, and these lots, as I explained earlier, are organized in chronological order by borough number, then by block number, then by lot number. But there's an incredibly sort of fragmented way in which one sees the city. Uh, here that is focused always exclusively on one of those lots at a time.
So even though here we have traveled only across from one corner of, of, a, of a block to another, that experience spatially feels like it's been really, really stretched out uh, spa spatially. Um, if the lots were to be put end to end on a single line in chronological order, it would form this, this uh, you know, uh, uh, one line that is made out of these 360,000 lots. Uh, and again, that took six months to get from the left to the right of that line. Um, this is a representation of this line in a sort of geographic form. So this is what the line actually, this is where it took me across the borough of, of Queens, and it's a way to compress that six-month experience into uh, about 20 seconds here. And it's really interesting to me that uh, in the end, when you arrive here, no, no single square inch of Queens is left unexplored in this path, if that makes sense, right? So once you arrive at the end. So this is the kind of journey that I, that I, that I took uh, to visit the, visit the uh, borough as a whole. So these are sort of equivalent representations of the same idea, right? The, the kind of geographic line and then the unfolding of that line into a single string. Uh, this is a kind of detail of a uh, kind of blow up of a really, really small portion of that line, what the image actually look like. The interface of the database uh, on the screen and then using a single lot to start to reference that particular place in each of the visualizations. So I think to me this, this drawing really became a, a, a way to talk about the experience of uh, this kind of field work. It describes the field work and it describes some of the, some of the, some of the, uh, some of the kind of emergence of a, a really a residual scale of properties that was uh, found as a result of that field work. Um, it is a similar kind of map that actually first drew me into this uh, large project on camping that I've been involved in for almost the last 10 years. Uh, it's really important when I talk about camping, I, I want to, to say outright that I actually don't like to camp at all. So to me, it is not a project that is born out of a kind of great passion for the outdoors. This is as rugged as my wife and I care to get what, like the one uh, weekend that we go camp every year. But my experience in the topic did stem from this, uh, an experience of sort of checking into a campground for the first time where I was handed out a map. And I think as an architect, I was really shocked that one might need a map to find their way into a, a campground. I had expected, I think, something far more informal, like find a spot in the field and go set up your camp there. And in fact, here's a map, and as I think that uh, prescribed in a really specific way where I could uh, put my, my, my tent. And that one map, I think, really sent me on this exploration that I've been trying to unpack ever since. So I think there was a kind of um, disconnect between the way that I had thought of myself as a prospective camper, the kind of labor of making the camp, of cooking food outdoors, all this kind of stuff, and the kind of reality on the ground, right, which is overrun with trailers and uh, chairs and so on. Uh, nowadays, you could check your email at the picnic table, uh, and we have seen a kind of uh, rise of a new informal type of campground in the United States for the last 50 years, or this, uh, 15 years, the kind of free uh, Walmart park parking lot campsite that have emerged. So there's a kind of, uh, there's, a, there's a trajectory here that I've been really kind of interested in exploring. There's really 150 years between these two images and really trying to understand sort of what happened, right, between the, these two images. Uh, these are campers. There are four campers in this image. Uh, if the campground really began as a sort of informal, you know, place in the landscape uh, to, uh, you know, set up your camp in a kind of grouping, a really a informal kind of open field, um, the campground has really emerged or evolved over the last 30 years into, uh, uh, into the last 100 years into, uh, while not exactly urban, a, an extremely sort of spatially organized uh, system that is uh, completely 
dictated by the movement of um, uh, uh, cars and RVs in the landscape, right? So you can really see here the signature um, sort of, you know, pull off for cars and the kind of pull through for RVs and each individual campsite has one of those, you know, connection back to the main road. Uh, nowadays it's even possible to um, go online and make a reservation of a campsite up to six months in advance uh, by uh, vi visiting a uh, campground uh, in, in this way. And again, I want to point out here that the kind of labor of making the camp on the left is significant. I mean, really everything here is made from scratch on the left. And uh, on, the on the far right, uh, within a few seconds, one is able to you know, claim a campsite uh, without even being on site, which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, so these two sort of virtual databases to me seem to have a kind of, you know, connection in a way. And I, I was particularly taken by the photographs that I, that I found on the database, which seem really absurd in a way that a, a camper could make a decision about, we were talking about this, right, where to camp, uh, based on these little photographs. Not very insightful about the kind of yeah about the uh, character of the place. So what I decided I would do again uh, would be to uh, virtually uh, visit a series of camp campgrounds across the country by uh, downloading all of these photographs and sort of organizing them and and, and uh, in a way that would start to provide a sort of. Um, uh, a, a representation of the larger place by, uh, you know, uh, showing those in a sort of organized form uh, in chronological order from the site number one all the way until the end. Again, uh, comparison between the campground project and the fake fake estates, there's a kind of idea that the unit of representation of both here is the single lot and here is a single campsite. And so there was a parallel there that I found really, really interesting. Um, the, the results of this work were collated in a book that was published at MIT Press a couple of years ago. Uh, and the kind of title of the book uh, is a kind of homage to the Ruche Project 34 parking lots from 1967. And one of the reasons the book is not called like 85 uh, camp, campgrounds, if it was a nice way to uh, limit the number of, of, camp, of campgrounds across the across the book, and the Ruche project is really about documenting a series of empty parking lots in the LA area, which is a really, it's a seminal work. Uh, and the arrangement of photographs, I think, really owes a great deal to the typological studies of the bakers, um, and that is sort of really, really clear even from the cover of the book. The result of the book are, you know, again, 6,500 photographs that are organized in these really uh, normative grids. Uh, there is, uh, again, a kind of a way, a kind of order in the book. All the campgrounds are organized by uh, zip code. And, and so there's, a, again, a, a reliance on a numerical system to uh, order the contents of the book. And some of the book is, is extremely normative and re repetitive in, in some ways. And I think that's really, really important. Um, you'll notice a lot of gaps in the photographs, and the gaps are really about recognizing campsites that do exist in the plan of the campground, but for which photographs are not available. Uh, but I think at other times in the book, there's a surprising sort of character that starts to emerge, both of the, 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 the particularities of the individual camp, campsites, but also the sort of larger character of the landscape. I think that a single Photo photographs may not be able to convey. Uh, it's important here to note that all of the photographs are not credited to a specific person, but the sort of, um, again, I think to me, the larger texture of the landscape really begins to emerge uh, as a result of the aggregation of all of these photographs into the larger whole. Um, I really struggled to try to kind of, when I talk about this work of trying to find other ways to compress the experience or the kind of scale of a campground. And so this has been a kind of recent exploration of trying to 
use a, a cinematic format to uh, try to show the, the, re the repetitiveness of the organization of that. Um, I am not ignorant of the irony that from digital bits of data emerge as a sort of analog work, which to me seems really absurd in a certain way to kind of go from kind of backwards in a certain sense. But I'm also really interested in sort of inefficient methods of field exploration. I think uh, lots of people have told me about, uh, I think they were, they were trying to tell me that, you know, GIS exists when I talk about the fake, fake estates. And I, to me, I, I, yes, it, it, it would have been really much faster to explore the borough by working in GIS. I'm interested in methods of exploration of field work that are really inefficient in a certain way. So an afternoon spent in a library browsing in an atlas is much, much more interesting and shows you all these sort of one, wonderful you know, graphics that you know, GIS would not be able to capture in the same way. And of course, um, this process of working in the database one lot at a time, I think produces a kind of insight that would not be possible without having struggled through this process. So to me, the, the kind of, if there's a message here, and I think we were talking about this over lunch with some of the students, is, uh, you know, to me, the more ambitious, the more difficult or challenging a project might be, that's what's actually going to draw me into the project more than uh, keep me at a distance from it. So. Uh, I hope, uh, I'd love to hear what you guys think about this. It, it was great. I mean, the conference was amazing, really, really fun. Uh, and I'm particularly honored that I get to speak about this work to my former, uh, such an influential uh, professor. I think it's, I'm really, really honored that you're, that you're here to see what I've been up to for the last few years. So thank, thank, thank you all. Thank you, Martin. We already have a question from. Hi, Martin. Thank you very much for that. It was fascinating. I have a very practical question. How did you find the little plots? The was it on a on an actual map, like a, a ordnance survey map, or was it? I was keeping a close eye on was the size of the lot, which was always a kind of an, an, an important field, and the value of the lot. The, if the value was under $10,000, it seemed worth stopping to look at what I was seeing. And if it was above that, I would just keep going. So I would stop only for unusual things. And that's how these things uh, were sort of came to emerge. But I think a lot of them would not show up on a the map. They're, they're too small. And I think that's actually one of the benefits. I think the map shows you some things, but it doesn't show you everything. So I think there's a combination of ways here of exploration. Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> I didn't get something. Uh, maybe it's the end of the day, but it was super interesting. But how do you link the two, uh, the two sides of your research, the urban leftovers and the camping? I mean, I think it was more, I was more interested in trying to, for myself to try to see whether there were links between these projects that are 10 years apart from one another and realizing that some of the methods of exploration are not dissimilar. But initially, I don't think there was a conscious sense that the projects were. Or maybe kind of fascination that you have with this very small things. Right, well, I think, yeah. <laughs> One with, with, with small things, I, I often think of it as excesses of surveying, like you, you went too far, you know, if, if you have a lot that's an eighth of an inch wide, you really have gone you know, very, very far. So I think it's, I'm more interested in exploring those moments where these excesses can be uh, revealed in a way. And I think that's what the fake estates did in, in a sense. I mean, to me, before I saw that project, I thought architectures were about making buildings, that when I saw that project, I, I, I saw kind of a different light, you know, in terms of how to put my, my architectural skills to work. And so I think, again, it, to me, it all goes back to the Matta-Clark project as a kind of 
the starting point of a lot of this work. So you might, you might argue here that the, the fake, fake estates is really the site of the project is Queens, but the site of the project is the Matta Clark project also. Like that's the project I'm trying to engage very directly. Um, and so even though the work in the gallery is about camping, I thought it would be interesting to sort of try to link that to a larger trajectory of exploration rather than just say, this guy works on camping only. I think it, to me it's bigger than, than that, you know, in, in, a, in a certain sense. I, I, I hope that I've answered your question. Thanks, Martin, for this um, amazing presentation. Um, one question that comes to mind with the, with the, uh, the fake estates work and the, uh, the procedural aspects of it and how you're, you're, put, you're testing it to the limit as much as Matt Clark was doing it. Uh, I'm wondering how, how these strategies, methodologies, procedural uh, ways of doing until the absurd gets revealed, how does this, um, I guess, percolate into your own teaching with students? Are you, are you exploring any of this in, in the way that, um, that maybe these methods can also be explored as a way to reveal certain um, loopholes into the... Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really important question. I mean, I think to me it has to have applicability in the teaching. Like, it's not, it's research for my, myself, but it's also ways in which I can fold that back into the teaching. I do think something like this is maybe there's a lesson about, you know, patience and sort of not being afraid to take on something you know might be helpful, but you also know might take a long time. So that, that kind of, I think, is a really important. Um, and also maybe to um, be open to ways in which to construct new forms of representation that are uh, maybe not, I mean, maybe are conventional in some ways, but also need to invent new parameters to start to talk about ideas of interest. And I think that is something that's really, really difficult to do. Uh, each project might call for its own set of graphic rules or circumstances. And I think uh, I find that there's invention even in, in the way that one might think about how to represent. So a drawing like this, uh, what I always come back to is that it's, that drawing cannot exist without the clicking. Like, it's about the clicking. And so I think it, it, it has no... And so that's why I feel like I need to show how it happened rather than just show the drawing as a product. I think it's more of a process of... or revealing the process of mapping the city with like a magnifying glass where you're looking at each lot in sort of isolation. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, I mean, I've uh, two questions. Okay. Um, the bottom line is strictly the order in which the lots are in the database. So the database is uh, by block number and then by lot number. It starts by borough, then block, then lot number. And the entire uh, million properties in the city are in that sort of extremely long line, if that makes sense. So this is just catching a really, really small piece of what that might actually look like. Um. Thank you for this presentation, Martin. Yesterday, uh, Francesco Carreri said that the one who wastes time finds space. Um, <laughs> I think that... I would agree. I think that that applies to a lot of work that we've seen in the past two days, but definitely to yours, uh, because you did find a space. It wasn't a waste of time, but you did waste your time, I guess, in a way. Um, but uh, I was wondering, you know, drawing the link between or, or questioning the link between the two or, or building the link, the, the camping project, uh, you went through a sort of this rigorous method of collecting and organizing by number and all this kind of 
building the database that the, here the city had already built and you went through. But the camping, you, camping project, you decided to also build a visual representation of these spaces. And I was wondering if you were tempted at any point of going to find these sites and photograph them in, in order to, to see if there was a, a, something repetitive about them in terms of materiality or in terms of, you know, they're filled with garbage or they're, who knows what you would find. But mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you were tempted to do that. I, well, um one of the campgrounds is the one I had to photograph because I wanted to at least one in the winter time, so I travel nearby to uh, but i I think what i I have not i mean that would be an interesting second phase. One thing that I did find is just the ways in which different um, campgrounds found to convey the um, there were campsites, and so for some, the, the, the National Park Service, for example, tends to photograph their campsites uh, fully occupied. So again, as I showed, I think earlier, you are in a situation where you really do see, um, you know, people here, or if not people, at least evidence of occupation. Whereas others, I think, are kind of interested almost in, I, we, we talked about this, as an unoccupation as a way that you could, you could be there, you could project yourself in there. Even that difference seemed really interesting to me and the kinds of patterns even in the, in the color of the tents, like there's a sort of new patterning that starts to occur in the equipment that is echoed by the, the patterning of the points of view or even what the sites are essentially all the same, you know, that there's, the only way you could tell difference here is by the number in front. And, you know, so there's some of it is incredibly normative, hundreds of campsites like this. And it, it's some of the book is really dry that way, but I think it has to be, it makes some of the other parts stand out a little bit more because of that dryness. But it would be an interesting exploration. To me, the, to, to use other people's photos cleared the kind of ethos of, of, of having to, you know, having to visit, having to people sign, you know, permissions and so on. Like I just found the, the work and so I kind of, I, I used it. Um, yeah. Uh, Kyriakos has a question, I think that's our, yeah, yeah I'm not. Uh, so, very fascinating. Um, Really impressed. Uh, small question: uh, Have you um, do you see uh, uh, a relation of your uh, exercise with um, uh, the writings of uh, Georges Perec uh, uh, in attempt to exhaust a place, uh, or uh, I mean the whole lineage of uh, uh, species of spaces and um, uh, his other essays about. Um, uh, how to organize a library, uh, or, or um, his his um, novel about uh, um, um, the, the life, uh, who, the cross section who? of the apartment building. Who who is this? Georges Perec. Um. Yeah. I, I, well, I, it's not anything that I've thought about specifically, but I think I think organization is something that is, you know, embedded in in the in the in the exploration and the project, but it, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that is some, something that was directly sort of, um, um, but I, I do think that these, these forms of organization are, uh, yeah, and the sort of echoes here of these kinds of echoes of a uh, number and, and the same are, are part of the things that really kind of drew me to the project is to reveal those forms of organization. All right. Thank you, Martin. I think it's apt that we finish on a presentation that clearly touches on what we uh, started the day with um, between the subject and the object uh, becoming almost fusional. Um, thank you for sharing your obsession uh, of the inventory and the slowness of it, I think, is a good point to uh, end our final presentation. Merci.